Hello, this is Dr. Melissa Stiles from the University of Wisconsin Department of Family Medicine, and I'm happy to be joined by Dr. Helen Counts, a clinical instructor for the Department of Family Medicine. Today's Fan MedCast is on infant formula. Welcome, Dr. Counts. Thanks. First, can you start by describing the major infant formula types? You walk through the grocery store and it's overwhelming now. <laughs> it sure is. Uh, basically, the formula that you're going to get at the hospital if you decide to formula feed is going to be your cow's milk protein-based formulas. The second big class is going to be your soy protein-based formulas. And then we can talk a little bit more about the hydrolyzed formulas as well. Those are the three main classes. Which formulas are hypoallergenic? The formula industry tries to trick you on this in the store, but by definition, the hypoallergenic formulas are not starting at the soy base level on down. That would be the hydrolyzed formula and then the most specialized formula, such as Neocate. So those are technically the hypoallergenic ones. The AAP has general recommendations for infant feeding. Can you describe these? Sure. The general recommendations, and certainly for practical purposes, not all parents follow this, but for infants in general, they say don't introduce a full cow's milk like you'd buy at the store until a year, no eggs until age two, and no fish, nuts, or peanuts until age three. And can you discuss iron, and should parents have iron in the formula or not? Basically, you want an iron-fortified uh, formula. Unfortunately, the stores do have low iron formulas for reasons which are unclear to me. But you want to have iron in the formula because of the rapid growth in the early stages. An infant doubles their birth weight by four months, triples their birth weight by a year. So we understand why iron is needed for that. It also fortifies the stores in their body. And if you look uh, at the data, because of iron that's been in the formulas, we've uh, dramatically reduced iron deficiency in the last 25 years. There's also no no medical reason not to put iron in the formula. What are the AAP's recommendations for feeding an infant at high risk for allergies or an infant with known allergies? Sure. Well, if an infant has known allergies, then you know, you know, you know what to exclude. Um, but if you have an infant at high risk, the AAP has to actually define that. And they say it's either both parents have to have food allergy or a parent plus a sibling. And that can be somewhat tricky if it's a first baby and one parent is affected. So sometimes we fudge that rule. But in those situations, you would first want to try to exclusively breastfeed if you can. And if you needed to use a formula and the baby met that definition, as I mentioned, then you would probably start right with a hypoallergenic formula. And as we discussed prior, that would be initially a hydrolyzed formula. Examples of that would be pregestamil, alimentum, or nutramagen. Those are the most common trait names for those. And can you overview what you do if you have allergy symptoms if someone's nursing? Sure. That can be a tricky one. Certainly you'd want to get your lactation consultant involved. As I was just mentioning a lecture I gave, the first thing I usually think about is, is there something sort of tainting the milk, like a spicy food, like a salsa or something citrusy. That's not an allergy. That would be something like an intolerance. If you don't find something obvious in the maternal diet, then you can go to the high allergy foods that can then go into the breast milk if the mother ingests them. You think about cow's milk products. You think about eggs nuts and fish as the most common ones. Obviously you wouldn't want to eliminate all those at once because then you wouldn't know which one it was. So those are the things you would initially think about and the lactation consultant can certainly help with that guidance. Soy formulas have exploded in the past decade, now accounting for about a quarter of the market. What's behind the soy fad? I'm not sure what's fully behind the soy fat. I can tell you that lay people know the word soy. I think 10 years ago it wasn't something that was necessarily talked about over the dinner table. But soy formulas are out there. Sometimes they're mislabeled. Sometimes even the word hypoallergenic is on the can, which is not technically true. But I don't think that's regulated by the FDA. Some of the soy industry also slaps a lactose-free label on their cans, which makes parents think that it's going to be low allergy. When we're talking about the world of allergy with formula, it's usually a reaction to the protein and not the sugar. So the proteins we've talked about, cow's milk protein, soy protein, and that kind of thing. So I think some of it has to do with marketing. That may not potentially be fully true, and just the fact that it's out there. 
Um, the AAP even has gone so far as to create a guideline for soy formula. They have it on their website that says soy is an okay primary formula. So they've even made a statement about soy formulas, which I find to be interesting. And that's certainly true. But I, I think it plays all into the role, maybe soy being discussed in women's health and that being out there. And then the mother usually being the one that's going oftentimes to the store and then figuring out which formula to buy. So I think it's all related. And can you expand, you touched a little bit on cow's milk protein and lactose, but can you expand on that and talk about intolerance sure. and yeah, allergy? Sure. sure. Lactose intolerance, there's many words for it, uh, is related to a deficiency of lactase. It's really plain and simple. Congenital lactase deficiency is documented in some textbooks and small print, but it's very rare. So it's not usually a sugar issue. When you're talking about allergy symptoms, we can talk about some symptoms that might be manifested with the infant. You're dealing with a protein issue. So again, the soy formula is picked up on this concept and tried to confuse the public by putting these lactose-free labels. But uh, the proteins are the large molecules that the residents and med students will remember from chemistry. And those are the things that present to the immune system. And those are the things that are creating the clinical manifestation of allergy. So that's a, that's a take-home point, definitely. And just in summary, what are the take-home points you want listeners to come away with regarding infant formulas? Well, I think definitely no cow's milk till a year. As an aside, cow's milk is also low in iron, so in the world of iron, uh, that's also a reason not to introduce that early. But also soy is not a hypoallergenic formula. Uh, the hypoallergenic formulas are the hydrolyzed formulas such as Nutramagen, for example, and then further down than that, Neocate, which is completely broken down. And also, we just wanted to touch on what are some symptoms of formula allergy that you might see in the newborn, and they are a variety, much like you see in allergy to other things. They can manifest in the GI tract, such as loose stools or vomiting or um, excessive gas. They can manifest as a skin rash. They can manifest in the respiratory tract uh, with uh, congestion, that kind of thing. And they can also be just sort of nonspecific, that the child just slept better with soy. So they can be somewhat variable. But th those are the take-home points. Um, also, another take-home point that I, I didn't necessarily mention in the PowerPoint is that colic is defined after six weeks of age. So technically, if they're having some symptoms of formula allergy in the first week or two of life, it's not colic by definition. And they define colic on purpose to be later so that we can figure out, you know, if it's related to the formula or whatever might be going on. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much. And that ends this. End of this.